Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. A warm welcome back to the Flora and Friends podcast and today you are listening to the second part of my interview with botanical photographer Lawrence Hill and uh, yeah this episode is uh, going to be a bit longer the first part was also a bit longer but I have decided to not cut it down and not to cut it in more parts um, I think this interview with uh, Lawrence was really beautiful and we touched upon so many aspects and some of them were very, very deep going, philosophical, historical and botanical, of course, as well. And I decided that I would leave this episode to the length that it is, as summer is coming and the podcast will also take a break in a few weeks. You will always have the possibility to come back if you can't listen to it entirely now and you will be able to enjoy the rest of it. Um, and I hope you really enjoy this perspective that Lawrence gives on scientific publishing as somebody who is not a scientist by training and not formally a scientist yet he's contributing so much to science and this gives a, a different perspective of what it means to contribute to science when one is not part of the official system. Um, yes, With that, uh, I wish you a great time listening to this episode and uh, I think it will trigger some philosophy, philosophical thoughts that you will probably keep with you for a while and think about a little longer. But uh, when we talk about contribution, you say it's, uh, it's your contribution to society and it's your contribution also to science because scientists are using your pictures and some of them uh, have also, you're also co-authoring uh, some publications and you have worked with scientists in academia. How have you perceived that? Um, well, um, where I've been co-author, fortunately, I don't need to To, to pay in order for, for that whole process. Um, um, when I have, I described a new species a few years ago, I, I, that's behind a paywall. Um, I find that frustrating um, because I'd like that article to be more freely available, but, um, but I would have to raise what it can be quite expensive to, to, to liberate that basically. Um, the, the process is, it, it varies. The first paper that I dealt with is in fact a translation from Russian. And I worked with someone from the diplomatic service here and we translated a Russian paper about bulbs because I thought it was simply the most important paper I'd ever read on Fritillaria. It's in Russian and no one's reading it. And uh, today, most people are publishing in English, which is all right for me. <laughs> um, but but as a universal language, it, it 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 makes sense because then everybody gets to access the information in a in a, in a better way. Um, but if something was published in Chinese or Japanese or Russian, in some of these more difficult languages, there's a good chance it's completely ignored. So that was the first work I did. And I just made that. I lodged it in a library. I lodged it in the library at Kew and I made it available online. Um, but the, the, the next work I published was, was a review. And I know they're not very well received. And 
that was as much a learning process for me. I reviewed 200 years worth of, of the, the Japanese fritillarians. Every single time there'd been a publication, how it'd been received and, and try to look at um, why after over a hundred years of, of work on Japanese fritillarians within the West, most of it was completely dismissed. Very little of it was ever, even read. Um, and that, that, that showed me the, the level of politics that was involved as well. Um, and although, again, I published that, it's behind a paywall, um, but I had to strip out some of the political element. And politics plays a big part in, in the science world, um, as well as cultural practice plays a big part in the scientific world. And um, that's something which I think would be useful for people to realise, to, to understand, um, because it does affect the, the outcomes of some of, that, the, some of the works that are, are published. But, um, but the, process, the process of being, um, in, being involved in, in, uh, in a larger project, they're very, very rewarding. And it's good to think that the knowledge that I've acquired, that I can input that um, and I can join with those people and fill in, fill in gaps in their knowledge. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a, very, it's a very rewarding process. It feels um, much the same as doing the web website. You're producing information which is contributing to a, to a greater understanding. I think it's very honourable that you have taken your time and written about that and translated literature and contributed to that scientific process in your free time. <laughs> this is, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great achievement and there's for sure very few people who are doing that. We know, we know the process of publishing from our side, and I can relate to that, that it can be very frustrating when things end up behind a paywall. We usually say we pay three times for an article. We pay to do the science, we pay to get the paper published, and we pay to read our own publications. So there's a lot of money going into scientific publishing, which makes it not always available for people to at all published because the cost that can come with a scientific publication can be 3,000 euro uh, for, for getting a, a paper in. Um, and that isn't available to everybody who is doing science um, on the side or even postdocs from us that continue a project or find data and want to analyze that data and do it in their free time, they often have trouble getting this published because there is just no possibility to pay for that. So um, it's, a, it's an investment of time and it's a, it's a difficulty for, yeah, it's a problem of accessibility from both sides for, for publishing and for reading in the end. Yeah. I know, I know open access is increasingly uh, when people put in their funding applications for their research, it goes, the, the cost goes in at the beginning. Mm. Um, and of course, it, it really is important. We, we live in a world of, of disinformation and actually quality information needs to be opened up. Science is often paid for by taxpayers. Why shouldn't the taxpayers be able to read it um, and, and know uh, and 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 come to understand how science is is how it's how it's conducted and how it's written up and have a greater understanding um mm. i think it would be of enormous benefit if, if yeah. we could open it up you know really much quicker than we do we are it is happening but not mm. not quickly enough i totally agree with you on that has it ever been tempting for you to uh join academic research or to to be more involved in that um, in a in an academic world to really do the research in a lab I, th I think one of one of the problems I face is I often see things that I want to investigate and I can't I either, either I don't have the skill the equipment and things and I, I I did a few years ago there's a question that bugged me from the very beginning and that is, um, is this idea that people hypothesize something, it's published in the research, and within a few years it becomes accepted. And people start quoting second, third sources, 
uh, and it's just adopted as true. And one of the things that's adopted as true, now fritillaria have some of the largest genomes of any living organism. They are massive, absolutely enormous. And there are various different biological reasons why that should be a disadvantage. But it's not, because they grow very, very well throughout most of the Northern Hemisphere in a whole variety of habitats and different altitudes and things. So if they are so handicapped, why are they doing so well? And the hypothesis that's really frustrated me is the one that uh, that spring geophytes, spring bulbs, particularly the earlier, earlier in the spring, uh, uh, the colder it is, they shouldn't be able to have normal cell division in the normal time frame that it would take. And actually their growth is a result of water filling their cells. So what you're seeing is not so much growth, but expansion, cell expansion. But this has never been tested. And if I get a fritillaria seed, the em embryo within that seed is tiny. If I put it on some moist tissue in a plastic bag and I put it in the fridge, depending on the species, it will germinate and grow. And it can create a cotyledon which might be up to 10 centimeters long. That is cell division at four centigrade of a plant with a large genome. That's growth. That's cell division against all the biological understanding. I hope sometimes in the database, I am pushing or hinting at people to go in different directions, to look in different ways and take that up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, it's tempting, but I'm, I'm not really qualified to go to those areas. I don't have the knowledge or expertise, but it is frustrating. I read the literature and I really disagree with some of the things that are being said, and I, I can't answer those questions. There's, there's, there's definitely something in there, and I think it, it may be many different areas of science where sometimes the modern organism, we've, they've extrapolated from it, but they've missed mm. something. Um, I understand why they do that. I mean, resources is, is limited. Time is limited. The number of people researching any one area is limited. So, of course, you extrapolate. But in doing so, you sometimes have missed the fact that nature is doing something we haven't noticed. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody brings a different perspective into these questions of how we study plants and what we know about plants. The names of plants often tell a story about how they were discovered. Are there any stories that you found were very particular and that told something very particular about the plant, very interesting or very much like culturally involving? Um, one of the plants I love in Fritillaria is Fritillaria campuscensis. And it's a plant that you can occasionally buy and things, and it's not uncommon, it's not in any way endangered. But it's a plant that has so many different elements to it. Um, in fact, once I was attending a talk where some botanist was really annoyed that some, some earlier uh, botanist had written six pages, like wasted his time on a plant. It was first described scientifically by Linnaeus, 1753, and then the name changed, in fact, from Lily to Fritillaria in 1804. So he felt... It's 200 years old. We know all there is to know about that plant. That's it. Done. But in fact, that plant is, it's a plant that um, when I first started going to the libraries and reading about it, one of the people I encountered was Eric Holton. Uh, he's very famous in Sweden because he looked at uh, the whole Arctic situation. He like looks down on the world and thinks of the Arctic because obviously when you're in Sweden, you're much further north. You have a very different perspective. We often have this sort of equatorial sort of look at the world, whereas like looking down. So he looked at the area which he named Beringia, which is basically the Bering Sea from Russia and Japan across the Aleutian Islands and Bering Strait so all the way into Alaska. And that plant is common in coastal areas in that region. And 
it's also the link plant that links Fritillaria to North America. How did how did it where did it originate? Which which um, which way did it travel? Did it travel into North America, out of North America? And because it's a plant that has such cultural significance, it is eaten by native peoples throughout that area. The people that live in the far east, uh, the far north of Japan, in Hokkaido, were actually not. Um, Derived, they're not descended from the Chinese, but they're descended from Europeans, and they were called the Jomon race. So this took me into another area. So there we have this early group of of of, of um, humans in that part of the world. They eat this bulb. Um, it's an important food source for them, a bit like potatoes. Um, it grows throughout that far part of Russia on coastal areas. Um, in Japan, it's unusual. It also grows in the mountains, but uh, to a lesser extent. Um, but it goes along that Aleutian chain into, I say, into Alaska. Pollen grains of this plant have been found 10,000 years ago in parts of uh, British Columbia. In knowing that it's an important food source, that you didn't think, did they move the plant? Did they move it from, from one side to the other? So you want to go back and look at the uh, the records for uh, 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 and the research that's been done on the migration of humans into, into North America. So you have to read that area of being. Um, native people in British Columbia, they eat this plant. They collect it in the spring. Um, they want If they want to store it, they put it in, it used to put it in seal oil. Most of this, this practice is not there anymore, but it was the first collected food in that area each year. So that actually becomes the point of the new year, because up till then you're living off the food that you've stored from the year before. So that becomes a culturally incredibly significant plant. But the um, the plant is, um, it's, it's also part of permaculture. So when first Europeans went to North America and, and encountered the, the natives, they dismissed their farming practice because they couldn't see them plowing fields and, 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 and using oxen. But what they were doing is they were going into the areas where they harvested various foods and they were weeding out the plants they didn't like helping the other plants flourish. And they were taking just the right quantity, always leaving a certain amount, so it would replenish and they would come back after say two years, whatever the time cycle would be. So they're inv involved in an early form of farming, which we Europeans couldn't even see how sustainable and how able they were in working the land. So, so here I have a plant that has all sorts of stories associated with it. It's got, it, it relates to it, the evolution of the genus. It, it relates to the migration of people. I don't believe they, they took it, but you have to look at that. But certainly they took the practice with them when they migrated in, that it was a plant they already knew. It's a plant that has cultural significance um, just within one plant. It's taken, it takes you on a journey in so many different places. That's beautiful. What a beautiful story about uh, human history and plants. And uh, actually, um, that species is also one that uh, Bob in, uh, well, now this week's episode, he has, uh, he has recommended this to plant this. It was one of the ones that is easy to grow and it really thrives in, in Sweden and in, uh, in cold places. So I may actually... in, in the Aleutian Islands, it will get 300 days of rain a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, it, um, it's doing well. I think I should actually get some, I, get, I should get one like that. And then I would say... But I, do, I have to stories. warn you, it's fly pollinated. Mm. It has no nectaries. So it uh, actually tricks the, the fly oh. to visit. And it tricks the fly by smelling like... Um, Dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> so I rather plant it far away from my. <laughs> uh, I like it. It's a beautiful plant. Mm. Um, in North America, it's called the outhouse lily. Okay. <laughs> Gives you right the instruction where you want to have it. Yes. 
Then I think we go into a little bit the creative part of your work and how you have used creative creativity to convey botanical information. You have been invited to expositions and you have showcased your work there and you have transformed the pictures of the plants into framed artwork, I could say. So can you talk a little bit about that process when you first got approached for an exposition, how you start to think and how you try to make art from the photography, which is an art on its own, but you make, you make compositions of your photographs. Um, it, it, it's very difficult because the questions you have to ask um, often, often people, lots of people say they're photographers and lots of people try to take photographs, but I think they often ask themselves the wrong questions. What they're often doing photographically is they're looking at photographs and they're trying to take similar photographs to the ones they've already seen. And they, therefore, if they can take one that looks like someone else, that gives, that validates that they are also a photographer because they can do that. But artistically, you're starting with a story. You want to say something. So you're thinking what you want to say, who your audience is, wh where, what, what location it's going to be in. You start at the, that end of the equation and you work backwards. <laughs> so you, you are then thinking, right, how do I tell that story? What elements do I need? Um, it is... It is very, very difficult, this, this creative process to sort of pin it down to, to one particular thing, one particular element. But um, I think I draw from many different resources and I'm very interested in conservation, I'm very interested in ideas of conveying ideas of the science, ideas about biodiversity, ideas on climate change. I want to know how we can convey messengers that connect better with the public. Um, and so I said, yeah, you, you read in different ways and you decide on different different approaches depending on those audiences. But I, it's extremely difficult to put that, that creative sense of quite how that is. Um, I, I, wrote, I, I wrote something down on some notes to try to sort of give an insight to that. And um, the most recent book I bought was a book written by Rachel uh, Giles, who's written a book about a about hundred paintings of plants that are held by Tate, which is one of our art um, uh, galleries here. And this is a lady who was unable to conceive, but she spent a long time coming to terms with that. And coming to terms was a societal problem. It wasn't, uh, I don't know the, the specifics, but I understand that obviously, like biologically, she wasn't able for whatever reason. But society was telling her she's a woman, she should be a mother. And so when I got the book, which is a great book, really enjoyed it, it's called Bloom, great book. I also went to look to read something about the author, to get the understanding of the author. And um, She'd written a blog for a group of women who were in a similar position to her. And this is one of the things that she wrote. She said, growing flowers has been a lesson for me in seeing nature's cycle close up. I've observed that some seeds grow and some don't. Some flowers bloom while others shrivel. Where I once raged against my body for letting my, me down, I now see that I am simply part of nature's randomness and a refusal to be fully controlled. And so inspiration, this is an example of inspiration. Inspiration comes from all sorts of sources and all sorts of stories that you want to tell. And they aren't just purely botanical stories. They're often stories about us, about society, that we can embed within what looks like a botanical image. Um, and so you can see that this sense of where, how does this creativity, where is it from? It's not a nice little neat box that I can describe and put together. And it's works like that. It's like that blog that I read. I, I thought that's a phenomenal interpretation of sowing some seeds. 
and the an understanding of nature that that gave, but also the resolution, you know, it helped her come to terms with her circumstances. So, so yeah, it's a very difficult sense. How do we describe that creative process? How do I put images together? Mm. Yeah. It comes from many different places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you have also, like, like in, in the text you just read, you have also found a way to use plans for a narrative, to talk to people, to talk about diversity, for example. Did that come like intuitively to you? How, how did that idea? Well, I, I'm, in part, I think it comes from your depth of knowledge. Um, when I started to read about Fritillaria, I was quite random. I just looked for everything about Fritillaria. Whereas scientifically, that wouldn't be a route that people would follow because they would be taxonomists. They would be ecologists. They would be um, a geneticist, they would have specific uh, um, areas of science that they would be dealing with. I just read all of this literature that I could get hold of. Um, but inevitably, that also meant, in, in terms of understanding, you also had to read some of the background from the different areas that you were in. So you had to sort of get this very broad um, understanding. And so then when you're starting to build this collection, you're getting these images, it, 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 the work starts to speak to you in a different way. And some of things that interest you away from Fritillaria specifically and the Fritillaria work together, they come together to start to, 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 to present, they literally present to you possibilities that you think, oh, yes, I can do that with that. I can do that. And I can tell this story. But I, actually, it can mirror as another story, which is also a useful story. So I can put them, I can layer them together, um, and that also means I can perhaps um, connect with audiences, uh, broader audiences or diff different audiences, because I'm able to to layer those stories together. So uh, it's 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 again, it's an organic process, but it's come from the the, the journey that I have taken um, in in the understanding that I have of this group of plants rather than say spread myself um into this very specific areas i could have just looked at taxonomy and i quickly deal with that and then you could look at another group for taxonomy or something and that would be i think quite narrow um so yeah that's how <laughs> that's how that process comes about Third way it's come from yeah and then the the audience is also an interesting part of that like who who is the typical audience that you would reach with your work and who could be another audience that you think would be worth reaching out to and how would you how would you reach a new audience you you told me a little bit um to the, the one of the previous questions that you need to know what you want to say and who the audience is but how do you put yourself into the head of somebody who doesn't have that fascination for plants yet well one of the things i think is really strong within images is that with the image you're starting with the idea that you're producing an aesthetic not necessarily pretty although often that you, you are making it pretty, but you're using an aesthetic that brings people to the image. So if they've come and they've approached that image, they might then engage with it. They might read something, they might read the title or a small abstract, but you're drawing them in through the aesthetics, which means that it is the aesthetic itself, which is in a way targeting that audience. A different aesthetic will, will target a different audience. Um, and in general, botanical works have a particular style and they're presented in a particular setting. So that means you've just got a particular audience. Um, and so often, if we look at the botanical illustrators, they are illustrating for science. People who produce images in the style of a botanical illustration, they are, their audience is not science. Their audience is just a more general audience that might like images of plants. They may not even know much about plants. They just simply like the pretty element of what they're seeing. So, um, so I think you, you think about 
an audience or multiple audiences and you think about the types of messages you want to give. And then you try to tailor it in such a way as say, to, to draw people to narratives that are visual narratives. Let, let them investigate through, through the work. Let them investigate whatever it is you, you hope you're conveying. Um, um, obviously, if people like books and things, they can read about these things. But a lot of people, they are, we live in this image world. They will be very taken with, with an image and they will approach it in a way they perhaps wouldn't have lifted that book, wouldn't have picked it up. So um, it's, a, it's a different way of engaging uh, with mm-hmm. people. Um, but those audiences are whatever, whatever you choose to target. But that's perhaps the style of the image you're presenting. Um, and um, I've, I've, I'm, working, I'm working on a project. I've been working on it for too long where I'm trying to change the visual representations for, for single plan with multiple representations uh, to create, to, to, to target different audiences, but then show them together to create the notion that those audiences might then cross fertilize because they might move to the other images that didn't initially attract them, but because they're together, they then, go and look at those so mm-hmm. so the 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 style itself is uh, you know the style of the image is 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 targeting those different different individuals what was the most difficult audience you have had um i i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm not sure i've had what i would call a difficult audience um i mean Clearly, you have people that are not the least bit interested in 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 some things. They just they just won't they won't pass. They'll just pass it by. But um, but no, I don't think I uh, I don't think I personally experience a difficult audience in as much as they just simply don't approach the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then maybe you if you're around, you didn't have conversation with those those individuals. So uh, I mean, there's there's some uh, photography itself always has the sense that some people with any arts discipline will look at photography oh, it's just it's just photography so you, 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 to some extent you do that you have that audience mm-hmm. um, art benefits from the idea that if you if you see a painting you know you know instinctively that that is hours and hours not only to produce that painting but to build the skill to produce that painting it's sort of instinctive for us we know that but I'd say the way that photography is presented is that we're all photographers. We can all do it, mm. um, and so um, so there is there is a sense that oh, it's only a photograph. Some might say, but <laughs> I think in the in the arrangements that I have seen that you have made, it's very interesting because like when you arrange the the flowers, for example, you you take the um, the tepals and arrange them in a circle. From far away, it looks like a sun. So that I, I can relate to that. That it draws this draws the people to it because if you are in a in a flower exposition or a botanical exposition, and you suddenly see a picture of a sun, you think like, "What's that?" So yeah. then you go there, and then you see look closer, and you see what it actually is. So that's I found this very interesting of how the plants were represented, um, or in lines with different organs, where you had the um, the style and you had the, the antlers aligned of different species, for example. It's very interesting because it shows you how different they are, even though it's just from the same genus. And it, it's so much information, even though it's very much simplified. So, and then you had, uh, um, I think it said male and female as well, which was, um, yeah, which also shows to somebody who didn't relate to what these organs do in a plant, they recognize, well, there's male and female organs and depending on what kind of species it comes from, it looks totally different. So there's a lot of variety in the world of plants. But I think that this, I think this presentation is important. I mean, other people are trying to present botanical narratives to have broader narratives. Uh, and I think it's, it is important because often with art, if someone wants to convey the idea, of, so the human society for, for generations has been seen as extremely sort of like, black and white, male, female, that's it. Whereas the plant world is 
unbelievably crazy. <laughs> there are so many different notions of plants that change sex in, during their life. It's a hermaphrodite, some that are male on one branch and female on the other. There's so much about that. Art will often be angry about our lack of appreciation of gender issues. And it'll just be an angry picture. But actually the people that most need to understand that we don't live in a binary world and to be more tolerant, those people are not the people who would even respond to the angry art. They need to be drawn in more, more, more slowly into that realization. Mm. Yeah, this is it's beautiful. How do you see mankind's interest for botany? Uh, How has it developed over the years? Where do you think we are moving with interest for plants and for botany in the next well, 200 years? Well, historically, when we look back, there was a status in having plants that were imported from elsewhere. These were rarities, difficult to grow. And obviously, that they were in a world where some other of our modern things weren't in, in existence. Um, but this is also very Western. A very Western concept. If you look at paintings of sultans or Mughal emperors, they'll often stand in a portrait holding a single flower. They loved flowers in their society. In Constantinople, the, the, the former name for Istanbul, flowers were everywhere. The, the whole society was full of flowers. If, if you had a newborn child, you put a particular flower in the windowsill that encouraged people to perhaps be quiet when they passed or to headline that you'd, you'd had a child. And you could use flowers to, to as symbolism in this way. It was quite common in, in that society. Um, but in the West, if we are importing plants to show off, well, we still show off. We just don't show off with plants anymore. Um, and yes, they become too common, too easily available. Um, I think society is at a crossroad. I think finally people are realizing that that the uh, our modern um, industrial age has all sorts of problems. It has problems in terms of what it does to the natural world, but it also has problems in isolating us from the natural world um, because that affects our our mood, uh, all sorts of issues about how how we cope with with other things in our life, which are easily offset by being in, in these natural environments. Um, so I think we're at a crossroads and I, I don't know where we're going to go. Yes, we need to deal with biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, how we will do that, it's extremely difficult. You know, the forces, the commercial forces are very, very strong. Some companies have embraced a change. Some are just washing themselves with a, a lovely green paint. <laughs> um, so it's extremely difficult, but science is a part of that as well. And uh, I also think that science this morning, I, I, I read a story this morning, which was, I, I'm still emotional about it. In Katarzyna's paper, She looked at amino acids in fritillaria. Now, fritillaria, although we don't have enough research on pollinators, we can speculate, which is what some of Katarzyna's work is being able to do, which those pollinators are. Because um, not every insect that enters a flower will pollinate it. Some will simply take nectar or pollen. Some won't even do anything. Um, Fritillaria come out almost the first flowers in many places they grow. You've seen some, some of the video from Bob Wallace. You can see that they're there with the snow melt. The snow melts and they're straight up. They are providing not just sugar in their nectar or carbohydrates in their pollen. They're providing very specific nutrients that queen wasps and bumblebees need in order to survive and go on and pollinate other plants and pollinate our crops. She looked at amino acids and there's very specific amino acids that are present in fritillaria at that very early stage. And that makes me think that 
when a woman is pregnant, she's advised to eat certain things in her diet because they're essential for the for the fetus, they're essential for the unborn baby. So just thinking that dandelions are good for bees because they've got lots of nectar, I'm not saying they're not good for bees, but that notion is just simplistic. Now, this morning, I read that Royal Holloway uh, um, University of London and uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Q have just published an article where they show that a common weed in the pea family has small levels of caffeine in the nectar. That caffeine helps fight a fungal disease in bees. That used to be a common plant grown in hay metal, meadows for forage for, for cattle. Now we cut down soya bean and feed it to cattle. cattle. But that fodder was actually the really important medicine for those insects. So, so yes, I, I don't know. I think we're at a crossroads. I think, it, I think there's a lot of momentum in terms of understanding and embracing the natural world more. Um, but I think that we need to accept that we know so little and that we really need to understand that nature is a complex web, all sorts of tiny little interactions that at the moment we're a long way from understanding and therefore we need to give it more chance to survive. Uh, sorry. <laughs> that was very beautiful. It was philosophical and I think it was very true because it's very hard. And I think as a scientist, I find I work in one area and my colleague next door is in another area. But when, when and how can we put all that knowledge together to really get a bigger picture? Like you said, you read about, you read everything about Fritillaria and you get a new picture compared to the taxonomist who reads one, the genetician who reads one, the molecular biologist who reads one area. And we, we don't see that. We don't take that um, bird's eyes, bird's eyes, what is it called? Bird's eye view. <laughs> yeah, bird's eye view, exactly. Encompassing view. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's, that what makes me as a scientist to have some insights into that world very how we as a human can at all understand the damage we are doing in our detail. I don't think we can. And that's especially important that we, we do what we can to protect, protect all the things we don't understand as well, and not just everything we already know about. So there's certainly many, many different plants. We haven't even, we are even not aware that they are there or what their ecological function is. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge, I think, for humanity and everybody needs to do their, their part in that. Yeah, I think everyone needs to contribute and, and as many people as can get the message, the, the better, mm. um, the better for all of us collectively. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe we come back with uh, some last questions here. Uh, I have, uh, I thought if somebody of our listeners was, were going to want to start on botanical photography, have a favorite plant, a uh, genus, or even just a plant, and they want to document it, what would you recommend? How should they start? Um, for me, it's all, I always come back to the idea, it's about storytelling. Um, if there's a story you want to tell, you think, how am I going to tell that story? And if you want to tell a story with plants or about plants, then you go about thinking, right, what do I need? What do I need in order to do that? So it may be equipment, it may be training, it may be that you need to read a certain amount of literature to, to inform yourself. Um, but um, I... I'm always, I, I love improvising in, in my work, always love improvising, um, which is why I'm always very low to say you must use this piece of equipment and you must have that technique. Um, I think photography is just full of possibility, absolutely full of possibility. Um, it can take time. There can be difficulties in getting hold of material, depending on, on what it is you want to say. Um, but um 
But those are those just the challenges. But yes, if you think there's a story you want to tell, or if you want to understand about plants, then you have to go out there and embrace. Have to 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 join clubs that exist, join some societies, um, um, see what some of the museums are 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 engaged with at the moment. Both botanic gardens and and natural history museums, they have got they're quite different today. They used to say, well, here are the cabinets, come and have a look. And now they they reach out, really reach out to the to to the public, and they communicate through through blogs, and um, and through um, what I think has been really great during the pandemic is the amount of um, um, online talks that people can attend, and they can attend from anywhere, and often free, often completely free, which I think is just such a positive uh, element of what's come out of 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 this horrific period that we're going through mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and my final question what is your big why what keeps you going all these hours on your photography you're not living from it there's no there's nobody who forces you to do it you're doing it voluntarily what keeps you doing when you are spending all these hours And then you, you may have people who, who tell you that's not the way to do it. Well, um, I think that if you, firstly, I'm, I'm passionate about the natural world and I want to convey elements of the natural world. Um, the database is facilitating, it's, it's for people to look and see how I've put things together and 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 see whether that makes sense um it's for people to use so that they can inform themselves and that's very important but on the on the work that you might want to exhibit it's 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 quite different because the physical world of presentation is very different to the digital world, the online world. So in the physical sense, you, you think quite differently. You have to think about scale in a different way and setting. But when you look at art in general, most art about which has plants in it is not about plants. It's very rarely about plants. Um, when you look at the Dutch masters, we love those those vases of flowers they produced and often we we marveled at their skill in painting them and we marveled at the fact that sometimes you've got say grapes and tulips together which of course i mean there are two ends of a season but those works that we are queuing up to see these great works about about plants they're not about plants those a number of those works, those Dutch works, for instance, the tulip is the blood of Christ and the three grapes are the Trinity. Those were mini altar pieces for, for well-off families to, to say their prayers in front of. Um, and if someone takes a photograph in the same lighting style with the same sort of groupings today, It's without all that symbolism of the past, but also it's not a symbolism, but it's not about plants. So I think it's really important. I really think it's important to create new artworks that talk about the natural world, that have stories about plants in them, rather than... So I'm passionate about producing images that engage people in the natural world. And, and so I don't... If I look back historically, generally, we... We aren't seeing that in, in, in past works. And say so if we celebrate those, we are perhaps missing the point. We're buying into the aesthetics. We're buying into the technicalities of how those things were, were created. Um, mm. But we aren't telling important modern stories. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. That brought, really brought us from uh, human history into arts, into technicalities of photography, into science and availability of scientific publications to uh, society. So I think we have covered a super large uh, range of subjects. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. 
I hope you have enjoyed this concluding episode on the Fritillaria series of our podcast. And now I have still two invitations for you. One of them is for giving us some feedback on the podcast. If you have listened to more uh, episodes here f uh, of this series or of the previous series, I would love to hear from you. And I have made a little survey that you can fill in within three to five minutes. And I will leave you the link to that survey in the show notes here. And I really would love to hear from you so that we can make the podcast even better. And you can express your wishes also for future themes and episodes or guests in that survey. And my other invitation is for visiting our blog post that you will find at www.flora-l.com forward slash blog. And in that um, blog post associated to this episode, you will be able to visit some of Lawrence's work that he has so kindly shared with us. And we also link to his webpage, of course, there. And you can also find the link to Fritillaria icons here below in the show notes. Before the summer, we will have one more episode of the Flora and Friends podcast on the story behind Flora and Design, together with uh, Melissa and probably also Delphine. So that will be released on the 23rd of June here on our channel. With this, I say thank you for tuning in with us and have a nice week.